Hello, everyone. I'm Yuta Nakajima, Senior Director at Hauser & Worth in New York. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening to celebrate our exhibition, Jack Whitten, I Am the Object, which is on view at our Chelsea location until January 23rd. Uh, we hope that you'll make an online reservation to come and see this exhibit before it closes. We're thrilled to welcome professor and curator Richard Schiff, along with celebrated artist Ellen Gallagher. Um, this digital event is closed captioned. Should you wish to utilize this function, simply click the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. The panel will also take questions at the end of the event. If you wish to submit a question, please do so using the Q&A icon. Thank you again for joining. And now it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Richard Schiff. I want to uh, begin with uh, a statement from Jack Whitten Studio Log, September 2006. And, uh, if you have a copy of this wonderful book, the September entries are, are especially interesting because they're extremely reflective because they're, uh, September is a month when Jack Whitten would return to the studio very refreshed after a summer spent in Crete working on sculpture. Then he would return to painting. And what you see on the screen is an image of George Washington Carver in his role as a painter. But of course, he's better known as someone who developed agricultural products as a scientist. And here's what Jack Whitten said. Scientists explore by specializing. I want to do the same in painting. My mentor is George Washington Carver. Carver specialized in peanuts. Where is my peanut? In my case, I must invent the peanut. And of course, the peanut for Jack was painting. And Carver is very important for Ellen Gallagher as a painter, as a thinker. And uh, I would love to hear what Ellen has to say about this image. Well, um, yeah, I, I pulled this image I wanted us to, to have in front of us. Um, so it's George Washington Carver uh, standing in front of one of his botanical drawings. Um, he's born in the 1860s. He actually starts out as a painter and he maintained his painting studio alongside his science laboratory. After receiving his master's in agricultural science in 1896, he soon moves to Alabama where he develops the experimental research station at Tuskegee Institute. He teaches there for 47 years. Carver was one of the first agricultural scientists to bring his research directly to the people, to poor Southern farmers and sharecroppers. He was desperate to address the devastating effects that mono, the monocrop farming of cotton had on soil. So he creates the Jessup agricultural wagon. And this is an early version of this. And there's actually a version of this that's still running today, that's now a bus. But um, this, uh, this wagon actually brought his research on soil replenishment, crop rotation, and diversification directly to the field. This was about ecological agency, scientifically detailing the practice of soil conservation to restore sustainability. Unless you forget, this is Tuskegee Institute commercial profit um, in the plantation zone. So this use of technology in the aftermath of slavery reprograms the, the field as a black nationalist space. And there's a Carver quote I wanted to read to bounce off of you, Richard. Um, I love to think of nature as an unlimited broadcasting station. I think that has a kind of resonance That's, also for Jack. Yeah, very um, relevant for Jack. Carver developed plant-based products through hemp and the peanut that you mentioned, the peanut-based formulas that he's so famous for, for medicine, construction materials, fiber, hair styling cream, and fuel. And his laboratory res research included his art practice and he even developed his own peanut and clay derived dyes and pigments. There is Carver in his lab coat and, and this is, uh, I know Ellen has some more thoughts about this, and it's it's the the combination of artist scientists that's so important for Jack. So right, and and that Jack actually, so he 
and you know, I we didn't say this yet, but Jack goes to Tuskegee Institute. I don't know if people know that. So in 1957, he enrolls as a pre-med student and a double Air Force ROTC cadet, right? And because he doesn't come from money, he uh, he's on a work study program. And one of his jobs is just doing basic cleanup, like a lot of kids doing, you know, cleaning up around the school. And he gets a, he's at some point he substitutes uh, for the person responsible to clean up and care for the George Washington Carver Laboratory, which now has become kind of a living museum inside of Tuskegee Institute. And Witten finds himself on several occasions alone in the laboratory handling um, Carver's uh, pigments and his mortar and pestle, he says, and, and his laboratory equipment. So he's there and he sees, I think, at a really early formative time, you know, painting and science together. And, and it's all one universe, this art and science inside of the, that lab. And I think, I think that must have had a pretty profound effect on him. Yeah, we can, we can uh, go on to image number five, where Jack is in his, we see Jack again in his studio uh, with this wall of images that were significant for him. Many of them have to do with friends and family and uh, experiences that he had. And, you know, you see the heavily soiled lab coat that he's wearing. He had quite a few lab coats, I think, and he could switch off and on. Um, and that experience that's so evocative, that experience that he had as a student handling the materials of Carver the scientist and Carver the painter. And, you know, it, it made me think of despite the fact that, I, that uh, it's well beyond my student days, when I was in Jack's studio, that's how I felt. I felt like mm -hmm. I was a student handling things. And even at your studio, Ellen, same thing a few mm -hmm. years ago. You know, I was fascinated by the materials that you use and the way you were using them. And all I wanted to do was touch things mm -hmm. all the time. Um, and the same in Jack's studio and Jack himself, such a tactilely oriented artist. We go to number six, another image of Jack in the studio mm. and you get a, a good sense of that <laughs> tactile attention. You know, And real... how these are made at this point with this washed ground behind them. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, this is beyond the period of the exhibition. This is uh, a few years ago. Um, but it's the, the digital technique, the use of the tesserae, which is um, so prominent in the 1990s when, when he really got going and in, in using that, um, that system. And, and then if we go to seven, uh, I know you have more to say about this, Ellen. Well, you know, I was just struck by something in, um, I mean, you have like the, best sort of interviews with him that you, because it's such an ongoing relationship you have, but this was a different interview where he mentions um, actually that, and, it, and it's something that I sort of remember um, in my schooling, like having these images of famous uh, people up, you know, and, and it wasn't always African-American, but in his school, Witten School at this point is segregated. He goes to George Washington Carver Elementary School. He goes to uh, George Washington Carver Junior High School. He then goes to Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School. So right up through Tuskegee, he's in a segregated universe. And in this environment, it's, it was practiced to line the hallways with these large, larger than life size uh, black and white photographs famous African-Americans. And it seems like a sort of mundane thing to do in a school. You would expect to see that. But it struck me, and I think the way that Jack brings it up in interviews, that it meant something to him. You know, it, it somehow it, it's somehow placing these images processionally as you move about your day from one classroom to another, this sort of seemingly mundane display is a kind of magic incantation. And, and then he mentions these photographs in an interview where he's discussing the early development of his work really stayed with me. And maybe, I don't know if you feel ready, we could move to the grayscale paintings. Yeah, I, and uh, yes, the uh, number, yeah. right. So these are, uh, 
are such wonderful things and very important for Jack, 1964. And 64 is, is the year in which he had a, a kind of a dream or a dreamlike or mystical experience where he, uh, a, a thought appeared to him and he, and he somehow didn't think it was his own thought. It was as if it was a, a some kind of instruction or gift that, um, that his uh, that his mind was photographic, and he would he himself would have to operate like a camera and photograph his thoughts. And at that time, he was making these sm small works um, by taking a a porous piece of fabric, a loosely woven piece of fabric that was uh, black and forcing white pigment through it from behind to really because I thought it oh okay yeah I believe it's I believe it's from behind or oh. or he's pressing the the fabric the down on mm -hmm. a, over the canvas yeah over the canvas so that the uh the uh undried paint comes through mm. and then produces an image that he cannot predict Mm -hmm. And so it's a kind of ghost-like image. Well, they, they look like blurry back, black and white photographs. I think he was shocked like that he, that he sort of made a photographic image. Yeah, per, I mean, per, precisely. It's, it's as if he had um, created a paint version of photography without quite expecting that. Uh, Can I read and, that quote again? Yes, please do. So um, he says he has he has pinned up on his wall in his studio, and you could see that was really the site um, in 1964 while he's making these. The image is photographic, therefore I must photograph my thoughts. But I, yeah. I think he was also having a really hard time um, figuring out how he was going to get what he wanted to make. How, how to make that happen. And, and I think it, he was sort of having a, a bit of a breakdown, he says, you know, it was the first time he went to go and talk to somebody about how he was feeling. And um, he really talks about pulling himself together. Like he, he couldn't handle these. He, he said he was literally walking around uh, New York going click, 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 click. <laughs> like, his, like it was a literal, that's a very literal quote. He really thought he had to photograph um, his thoughts. Yeah, and then that these, is... these things were, I think they scared the shit out of him because he didn't predict them. He didn't paint them. They're almost like a kind of spirit photography that, that comes out through the process of painting. Yeah, precisely. And, and in the, it, we're going to show a couple of images of the 70s and, and 80s, but, but it really comes all together for him in the 90s. At, at at least it in terms of his the thoughts that are recorded in the studio logs because he recognizes he fully recognizes the the digital nature of this process that um, he he thinks of photography as digital in its essence not because of, of the development of digital cameras, but he thinks of it as always having been digital because the photographic, the light sensitive surface records reality in its elemental form, in its digital form. And he was picking up from uh, quantum mechanics and from, uh, the, the, uh, and from uh, genetics and the, uh, understanding of DNA that everything in the universe, whether organic or inorganic, had a, a kind of unstable, exchangeable flow of digital units. So he sometimes called them molecules. Mm -hmm. And looking back at these works in 64, I think he thought of them as having realize something like a digital photograph that there was a inherently a, a grid 
underlying because of the weave of the of the tool or of, of the you fabric. Said that you said that was really incredible. Uh, I don't know if you you discussed that with Jack or you were just thinking about it, using it yourself. That the in a sense the grid of the tool that he was pushing. So he has a slat. He has a, a white acrylic paint. He's he's experimenting with acrylics, uh, acrylics directly with Lee Boncourt, and and he's. Uh, pressing uh, white and black paint down and then wiping over the tool, what I understood. And that's, you said, maybe that was a kind of digital space for him, the grid of the, this fabric over and, and under the, the canvas, you know? Yeah, I- These fabrics, I, these, these textiles he was getting. Right, I, I mean, I, I think so. I don't think, uh, I can't recall whether we ever discussed it quite in those terms, but he he certainly felt that way about just ordinary canvas, that mm -hmm. it, he was very conscious of, of the weave and the, the grain of it, the heft of it in some cases. So the, and of course, Ellen, you're, I mean, in part, I think you're thinking of the, of the next image of, um, that would be number nine, where uh, there is this raking, combing, uh, system that he developed and you probably can describe that um well this well i think it's interesting that it's you know it goes from 1964 to 1970 that it's like not until 1970 that he can revisit the implications of of those paintings from 1964 right right yeah i i believe so i mean there there's a lot and of he, he talks about like that he goes to talk to a therapist and he does hatha yoga and he um he starts to develop uh, a practice of okinawan uh karate but i thought it's really interesting that in 1968 he marries mary and he meets mel edwards and he meets Frank Bowling and Al Loving. And I think that he's, he, so he's, he situates this development that he's able to go back to 1964 with a process of self-care, you know, uh, but I think it has to also do with the people he has around him that, so it's, it's self-care. It's not just this kind of, I did yoga and, and mm. uh, karate. I think it has to do with, he creates this, this realm around him, but he, he, he revisits it by, he creates this 12 by 20 foot drawing board and he tops it with industrial grade linoleum. It sounds like he had a huge studio, enviable, enormous studio right from the beginning. Um, and he, then he, he makes, and, and all the language he uses is, is photographic darkroom language that he, he makes a huge 12 foot wide T from two by fours, um, which he calls a developer. And that, so he lays down, these are, this would be, this is a small, smallish painting, but these are quite big paintings he's already making and they had to be slabs. These were the slab paintings and they had to go over with one swoosh. That was a developer. And later he goes to canal rubber um, and he, he adapts his, this, this uh, T tool further, the developer by attaching three eighths inch um, uh, neoprene black rubber. Um, and, um, and that makes the swoosh even maybe more, um, I don't want to say more blurry, he can create more of a blur. So it's, it's interesting. Um, this is a really beautiful smaller version, but that he's really working on a pretty big scale right away with these. And yeah. then all the language he's using to develop these things is, is all based on, I mean, he's, he's taking dark room tech language and using and making that to make his work, these sort of non-relational marks he's making. But he's also working from underneath the canvas. He's got forms underneath uh, the canvas that will then imprint. And, um, and so he's printing as well. So he's, he's doing a lot of different things at once. And he's, he's always able to map where he is in the canvas by these like these registration techniques he develops within this kind of dark room process he's, he's making in, or painting. Yeah, so the, the final image is, it's as if it's instantaneous, the final one of what, what we see on the surface, because he's applied um, wet paint, various colors in, in a work like this, uh, and they're in various parts of the surface, and then there is a, a raking or combing 
gesture, which is done in one swoop, which blends all of those colors together in a way that's not entirely predictable. And wherever, uh, like in the work that's on the stream right now, there's a little bit of a zag in the bottom area. And mm -hmm. that means there was something, of some foreign matter underneath the surface. Mm -hmm. um, it could just be, uh, it could be a piece of wire that was under there and it, it causes a little blip in the screen. This one always reminds me of, uh, of a television screen with a, mm -hmm. the cathode ray going back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and absolutely, then he was so proud of the big ones uh, because, I mean, he said uh, he had always admired de Kooning, whom he know, knew, and, and de Kooning had mentored him a bit in the early years, around 1960, 61. And, um, and de Kooning was known for being able to make a fast mark. And Jack was very proud of the fact that he could make a very fast mark over a very broad surface. He called them one line paintings, just mm -hmm. one sweep, and the painting was was achieved. And then, uh, so there, that's the probably the most salient uh, method of the, or the most characteristic method of the 1970s. And then in the 1980s, if we go to number ten, he's working with. Uh, molds taking uh, casts of surfaces and objects in New York, all kinds of things. I mean, here, this is partly uh, the, uh, it, it's partly derived from metalwork uh, and uh, like diamond plate, although this, I'm not sure this is strictly speaking diamond plate in this one, but also uh, bubble wrap in some cases, which- So these are creates, molds he's making with the acrylic. Right, making molds and- And now it's not necessarily with the paint. He's really starting to use the medium, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of medium. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then taking these fragments and combining them to make what he thought of as collages. Um, and, and it's, I think, at this point where he gets very insistent about saying that he doesn't paint paintings, but he makes paintings because he makes them out of pieces of paint. He builds them, I think. He's, yeah, he builds yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And these are, uh, this one very uh, much a statement about um, the New York environment with the textures of the city. Others are memorial works. But this takes us now into the 1990s and we go to number 11. Mm -hmm. And what uh, maybe connects the last image that we saw and this one is uh, Jack as, a, as an urban or in this case, maybe country scavenger. And he was always, he was interested in any kind of material thing and the possibilities of making that could be drawn out of it has something to do with, uh, for him, the spirituality of matter, of material things. So when he was casting all those molds from the New York environment and from ordinary objects, they're scavenged images. And here, uh, it's uh, probably the seat of a chair, which is the foundation for this work, which is wooden, and the burner from a range, the cooking unit, and then something else. And I mean, Ellen, you probably have your own thoughts about this one. Um, well, I do wonder about the the um, the form, the the the. the um, the support for the painting, and and if maybe the subject um, Agirula, if she used it, it seems almost like a child-sized chair. Or if it had belonged to her, you you wonder. Or or did 
Mersini use it. Um, you know, you, you, it has this feeling of, of having belonged to somebody and, and you feel this form. And, and I think the secret, which extends from the, um, the concentric black iron rings um, of the stove burner, it, this for me is, is a kind of like memorial as conduit because it's, you know, it doesn't hang, it, it really extends out, it's taut. Mm. And, and it's really like, um, I, I, I was thinking about this and I, I found myself thinking, you know, why am I thinking of Walter De Maria's lightning field with this? Why am I thinking, I just, that's sort of how I work, you know, um, it's, it's a bit random, but I, I couldn't, I didn't understand why I was <laughs> thinking of that. And I don't know if I should be thinking of it, but then I thought, um, this this uh, iron burner, this rigid extension, is a kind of is is it to catch or to release energy? And I, I started to think that um, like a like, this is what a, a stove or a forge does. And and I, I have to for me I have to think of Ogun here. Um, and I I think uh, the god of iron and the protector of children. And um, I read this because he's already he's he's uh, been going to Greece obviously and he is he's he has all, at this point a secret practice where he's he, in the summers he's working on his sculptural practice and he's really influenced by African sculpture and he I think it's directly uh, uh, calling to Ogun to to protect this child who has passed away I, yeah I uh, I mean Ellen I th I think Jack would be delighted to to hear what you've just said, that to making, making those connections, because uh, what has so often struck me about the way he would talk and the way he would think about his own work was his capacity to switch from a very, from thinking of, of, of things in terms of, of the principles of physics and advanced physics, which he kept informed of, that theoretical scientific end, and then just switch into mythology uh, and uh, a kind of spiritual discourse and seeing that it was all one thing. And of course, there are scientists who, who work that way also, who, are, who switch back and forth and um, detect in what they discover in an, an empirical way about the universe and, and think of it in terms of something like spirit forms or mm -hmm. um, energy. I mean, you referred to energy, I think, and energy that can flow from one place to another. And you also, you're also referring to this, I mean, the child size quality of this. And you can imagine a child, I mean, she was, when she died, she was a teenager, so she wasn't really young, but she was still a, a young person. And uh, the person that, that uh, Jack befriended and, and was um, to, which, to whom this is dedicated, you can imagine her being delighted by that kind of color pattern. And looking at it, the side view is important. We have side views. Oh, we should views see that, yeah. Is this yeah, well, it's yeah. it's 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 there, and yeah. um, it's uh, that the tesserae move around the surface over the edges. Exactly. I think this, the, this further souffles the painting that it 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 does have this feeling of of breath or of of being. You know, you, I know it's wood, but it it has a feeling of of being uh, uh, souffleted uh, somehow, uh, and and it it uh, also creates this volume and addresses the thingness of the painting for me. And it makes me think it's something Mondrian does pushing around the edge of a stretch canvas to bring out the thingness of the painted realm, which somehow makes it even more magical. It's yeah, it does. And, and, uh, you know, the, the uh, airy quality, of course, has something to do with the reflectivity, which uh, another thing that uh, mm -hmm. Jack was so concerned with. And I mean, here, um, the sort of the matte reflectivity, if that's that's a kind of contradiction, but of, of the metallic element and then the transparency and reflectivity of the uh, mosaic elements, the tesserae. We 
I we have a we're going to have a time problem, Ellen. Okay. So, so let's move on. Yeah, we better move on. Okay. Um, so here that is it, one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's one of my favorites also. Yeah. Uh, okay. The the one that Jack dedicated to his sister, who was a professional hairdresser, and the bottom element is um, that odd color, which is sort of brownish and blackish, uh, is produced by embedding hair in the, um, in the acrylic tesserae. And then that, and there's a reflective mirror there as well. That's not mm -hmm. a That's hole. not a hole. Yeah, that's a mirror, yeah. And, and then around the outside of it is a, um, <clears throat> Is a different kind of um, mosaic effect, and it's it's just wonderful. It's it's like switching maybe from uh, I don't know from order to randomness in a way because the, because they're so they they hit each other and mm. and there's a gap when they not there's I don't mean there's a physical gap in the painting, but your mind creates a gap because the way they're produced is so it's such a different. Um, I, I thought this was really an incredible homage to the artistry of his sister. You know, I mean, I thought- uh, Absolutely. Uh, the, the two panels of the hairdresser, they're radically different. They're foreign to each other and, and, and they're divine. And I thought it's really about um, artifice and, and prosthetic form in the magisterial art of black hair, you know? And, yeah. and, and at the same time, I thought it could, um, you know, uh, they, you know, they used to call wigs transformations in the early, early part of the 20th century, and you could also imagine it as a, as a, because he does seem to have a very good sense of humor, um, and like that quote you started off with, I need to find my peanut, um, uh, that it could, he could also be teasing his sister and ever so gently making fun of his mm. sister's weave. You know, yeah. this idea, and, and it made me think of this uh, folkloric character that Langston Hughes created called Simple. And he said, I don't know why they call wigs transformations because I have seen some women put on a wig and they were not transformed at all. So I, I think it's both. I think it's, it's an absolutely beautiful piece. And, and I think it's about, definitely about the, you know, magic of prosthetic form in black yeah. hair and and it's an homage to her and maybe also a tease i don't know it, there's something yeah I because mean, very, of the, the silver leaf that's that's in it as well so there's something to catch your eye that that one part is natural and one part is 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 mineral in a different way yeah yeah and i mean it's all very relevant to, i mean i i see now how relevant it is to your own work but yeah. so um number let's see number 15 now we so we have uh so this is the third of of uh relatively small works i mean this this isn't that small but it's small compared with uh ones that we will uh come to which are much bigger and the um this is a well, they're all favorites of mine, but mm -hmm. but this one really knocked me out when I first saw it. And I had I saw it only at Hauser and Worth for the first time. I had never seen it in uh, Jack Studio or uh, in as an image uh, that had been reproduced anywhere. And uh, so it's three panels, and my suspicion is that they were not intended to be put together. And he had a kind of inspirational moment and realized that they would do wonderful things if they were put together. And there's a very complicated framework on the back side, which we can, we don't get much of a sense of it, but the, the side view helps a little bit mm. because you can, you can see that the three panels are canted at different angles. And this means that the, now they're, three different qualities of reflectivity, three different qualities of color, but in addition with the three different angles, that uh, interaction of reflection is that much more complicated and enhanced. So one can 
just you can just stare at this for a long time and be amazed at how these three elements, which seem to have not very much to do with each other, which may have started off not having much to do with each other, come together in a work that you can't imagine ever taking apart again. You know, you, now that it's there, it's congealed, you don't want to see it any other way. I mean, it feels like it's on the verge, you know, it's, it's like it's, it's, it's about to um, become. It, it makes me think of a kind of vessel in, in a way, and also in the way that the viridian seems to migrate into the top amber bit from the lower mm. bit. I mean, it, it feels like it really comes together. It's, it's really meant to be disparate and it's, it's in your mind that it goes liquid your mind has to activate it to make it go liquid into one thing and that he's keeping it distinct on purpose um, and that you put it together. And it feels really like almost like a, a, a proposition for a painting to me, you know, like a kind of like, you know, a proposal in a way. Yeah, as, as if it's asking, can this be a painting? Mm -hmm. Well, and, I think it feels really confident it is, but it's showing mm. you something because what? it's, you know, it's, it's sort of, um, you know, it's playing with, with some of the protocols of sculpture, but it's, it's really acknowledges it's a painting and it's, it's, it just feels to me like it's on the verge of, of like, you know, um, yeah, of, of kind of liftoff or, or, you know, in a way. Well, yeah, it, it, and it, it feels is. that way when you, when you look at it from the side as well. Mm, yeah, and I mean, in effect, it's a, um, it is what he set out to do. It's his peanut. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a new, it's, he's invented a new kind of painting. Mm -hmm. And it is, it has, it incorporates into it so many of the features of sculpture. And of course, he was making wonderful sculpture. And to some but extent. But not showing them yet. No, not showing them. But secret, yeah. to, to, to some extent, uh, his sculpture is has a lot of painterly qualities as well. Mm. Um, I mean, he's just moving back and forth all the time. And there is a magic to the way that he transforms materials. And, and of course, what he had done in the 90s with these with this tesserae technique is to have transformed the nature of, ac of acrylic paint. So that it became a building material and not a liquid, uh, malleable kind of thing. Uh, its malleability is in the construction process, but not in it's it's not a a brush technique anymore. It's not a brushed material. There, are, in some of the works, there are brushed elements, but. Primarily but it is when that moment structural. when they go that bam, you know, where it becomes, you know, he, he talks about um, when he's young, uh, you know, when he was still playing uh, the tenor sax and he he would go and sit with, uh, try to sit in with Art Blakey and the messengers. Mm. And, and, and he talks about um, sort of trying to, to sit with uh, Coltrane and, and actually talk to him. And then Coltrane was just, you know, he would try to talk to him about technique, kept pestering him about technique. And at one point, Coltrane snaps at him and says, you know, Jack, it's the wave, it's the wave. And, and it feels like that, that's what I mean by go liquid. Like he, he's, he's mm -hmm. really acknowledging that it has to happen, you know, in your mind. You have to, and, and your, the viewer has to do it because he's already done it. So it's, and so he, he does make them go liquid in that sense. Um, but, but yeah, it's kind of, it's like science. It's something that happens um, in your mind. It doesn't, it's not with a brush. He, he also, yeah, he sometimes used the uh, expression, getting it off the wire, which has, mm -hmm. uh, as, as if you're, you're drawing it out of the ambient air. Um, and it's a mental thing as well as a physical thing. That, uh, and, you know, we've sort of, we've drifted away from the, sense of photography but mm. but um but that's how he was thinking of 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 photography uh, uh again as something that was a mental phenomenon he had a an encounter with another african american artist herbert gentry who mm. who told I, him i have as, that quote yeah yeah it, it, why don't you why don't you the read Ron it Brown, you, i was going to talk do you want me to read it sure um 
Okay, well, th that I thought was related to the Ron Brown, but okay. well, we'll we'll hold we'll hold it till till then. So we okay. have. Let's go to number seventeen. Yeah. yeah. So we're we're now going to talk about uh, I think uh, four uh, yeah. large yeah four large images, mm -hmm. um, large works, and uh, this is one of the masks and the masks have a particular form to them. Uh, and the, the larger mask paintings are dedicated and they are either, well, they're all memorials and sometimes they refer to tragic events. And that's true of this one, which refers to the uh, uh, a, a, a number of uh, something like uh, 18 or 20 school children in, in a town in Scotland were shot by a crazed person. Uh, and that occurred uh, just, just after Jack had, if I'm remembering correctly, just after Jack had finished this painting. And he then dedicated it to, uh, or somewhere along the line while he was working on this painting. And, and he dedicated it to, to that event. And, you know, perhaps the brilliant, color here refers to the liveliness of the children, but the mask form can mean so many different things. And it, mm. it also refers to African traditions, but as a, as a painting, it's a, a, a very innovative form because it's, it's free hanging and you can imagine it wrapping around a very large head mm. as a mask folded in the center. And, and that's true of these mask forms. We, we can- Well, you see. also let's, said, you also think you could imagine looking down a barrel in the sights of a gun yes, as well. Yes, right, and you see, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, and it is really um, severed in a way that the other, um, uh, connecting pieces and the other masks are not. If we go to then, you know, this one is really uh, cut in a way that that mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen the other ones be so separate. The attachment, the, the part of the seam is, is really, um, you know, a different material. It's, yeah. Right, you mean, you mean the, the white area? Yeah, or, yeah. Yes, yeah, it's a very, very um, strong, graphic form and then mm -hmm. right the others seem more pliable or uh less well none of them are rigid they're more but, woven together you know they're more yeah. um this is really saying you know it, i i think your reading of it is i thought it made sense you know that it could be that as well i mean i don't think he would fix it but but i i want to just we, we should maybe move on but this idea yeah. that he um he comes, maybe we should go to the next slide, to slide 19. Um, this was um, dedicated to um, uh, Ron Brown, um, who was the um, head of the DNC and then became Secretary of Commerce under um, uh, Bill Clinton, if I'm correct, right? And he is, um, he dies in a plane crash. And, um, but, this idea of, of naming things or finding um, their, their memorial site as they're either in process of being made or, or a after they're finished, I'm really interested in that. That um, actually, um, that, that he in, um, the painting is completed on March 29th and on, um, on April 3rd, masked too for Ron Brown, which is when, right, when he passes, when he has his heart, yeah. dies in this horrible accident. But in April 2nd, um, there's a log entry that, that you, I think you found, I thought that was so beautiful that you wove this in from, um, he's a generation, uh, Her Herbert Gentry is a generation just before um, Jack Whitten. So he's, he's uh, 1919, he's born and he dies in 2003. And Romare Bearden wrote that Gentry's, Herbert Gentry's method is conceptual rather than realistic. 
One senses in the chromatic emotionalism and biomorphic forms, the strong pull of the unconscious. Um, but uh, apparently Gentry, uh, I, I also think that I looked up Gentry after we were speaking about him and, and I do think he had an early influence on Jack Whitson for, for certain. Um, certainly the, the painting, the black, could, could seem to have a relationship with Herbert Gentry. But um, Herbert says, experiences have already been photographed in this subconscious. To which Witten responds, well, if this is true, my interest is in digitizing the subconscious. Right, yeah, so, right. He, he always thought um, that he was taking things one step further and making, uh, because, I mean, that it recalls a, a principle that he had of, of um, recognizing the technological transformation that had occurred in the culture because of uh, the systems of mass communication and the uh, systems of digital knowledge so that, that he needed to think of the, of the mind in a digital rather than an analog way. Uh, and it's so consistent with the, the use of the tesserae, which he well, thinks of, he, yeah, thinks of as his molecules. <laughs> and yeah, he says he discovers that working, looking at African sculptures, that, yeah. that the digital is already uh, there. Yeah, right. And and the and the well and this and he was also very much attracted to the idea of animism. Mm -hmm. So in African sculpture, yeah, there is the, the, um, the digital is there for Jack because the digital is the union of spirit and matter. And in, in African sculpture, he perceives the union of spirit and matter as he did, uh, I think also, but you know, maybe not in as um, central a way for him in Minoan sculpture in the mm -hmm. ancient ancient uh, art of, of Crete. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go. Let's go uh, back to the full image rather than the detail number yeah. nineteen. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, with the round brown mask, it's um, it, he dedicates it after the event. The work was already finished, but he had one of these magical moments where he thought he saw the features of Ron Brown in the mask. And he- uh, He says refers, it was hawk-like. Yeah, a prominent nose. Yeah. And, and then I you didn't really that. see that when I was looking. I was looking no, at, I didn't, I, I sort of see what he means, but I don't think he has, he said, look at his, look at the man's face. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I also had I had trouble with that also. I'll just <laughs> I'll just take him at his word. Yeah, and, and that he saw it, and and then we have this um, crease down the middle, so to speak, and and the triangular um, linear elements, the whole thing, and the notch in the top, and you know it is a mask. It's just very very big, and you can imagine yeah. wrapping it around your your own face if you reduced it in in size. So shall we shall we go on to the yeah, to the to next the, to the memory yeah. sites? So yeah. that's tw 21. Um, and uh, this is a phenomenal painting. I mean that it's so odd because the external boundaries of it are so irregular. It's pieced together from a number of uh, pieces of of uh, fabric, but they don't necessarily correspond to where the where it seems that there are breaks in the mm. in the image, mm. and the uh, color quality comes comes uh, through in part because of uh, Jack's having used burnt bone oh, uh, right. to uh, make the the darker brownish and blackish pigments. And also apparently applied a flame, actually burned the surface of the acrylic in places to get a, a kind of charred effect. And he 
said at the time that, I think it's in one of his interviews, that he wanted to make an image of man's inhumanity to man. And he wanted to make an image that referred to uh, an entire history, like the history of, of human evolution. Mm -hmm. And so there are seven skulls that are detectable in the uh, mm -hmm. pattern of the tesserae that uh, I don't know if we would ever figure this out from looking at it, but he referred to them as seven different ages of human evolution. And then there's Ellen, the, there's the Yitzhak Rabin. So it's a yeah. reference. It's here, a memorial so. to Yitzhak Rabin who was murdered, assassinated by right-wing activists. And it's yeah. about man's cruelty to man. So I, yeah, this, uh, so this is this. So I, I just this is an incredible piece, and in that it's it's so. I think it's also he's at a point where he knows he's in abstraction, and it he sort of says, um, I don't have this quote, but he, he speaks to it doesn't really matter. It, it's really for him. It's not about whether there. It's it's not. He's not interested uh, in making it. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's narrative or abstract or. Or uh, if there there are you know elements in it that are recognizable, he he sort of is so past that in this digital space. And I was also thinking about you know just you know you use the word technology. I think I tried to imply a little bit um, with with speaking about George Washington Carver's um, that it was really a kind of black nationalist use of technology. That it's a I mean I don't know how you feel mm. about that. I know it, it in some ways it seems to go against some of what you're saying about this husk technology being this, is that the word you use, this, this uh, impenetrable, uh, unknowable in a way, except uh, to itself, uh, but, you know, um, away from kind of culture. And, and I feel like Jack really is, um, I mean, your, your text is so beautiful, so I don't want to step on, on anything wrong, but, but I, I feel like this is so much to me about like, creating a kind of digital space in painting. And, and it is so much to me, it's, it relates, and even this capturing of the light in the work, you know, I, I'm really struck by something he says, uh, that there, any light that's in a painting is light you put in it. You know, he, he's speaking about people who are talking about the natural light hanging in painting, where you would hang it. And he, he's like, it, that just struck me as so solid and so intense when he says, any light that's in a painting, you are, the artist put it there. You know, you put it there. You need to like it's a physical thing you put there. And then at some point he says, "I just, I got, I didn't understand how old some of the light was I was dealing with. I found that like it's really that it had traveled so far to get to us. And and we should also say this is a really beautiful example where he is using, um, he's really suspending. We didn't talk enough about that uh, suspending uh, pigment." in just a really, there's just a little bit of pigment in some of these cases, and it's a lot of um, the medium itself. So they really work as lenses. So they're really conducting yeah. light at different levels. And so like he's really controlling. So the pigment is one element of the painting, um, but it's really this lens that he's, he's creating in, in that's physical that um, can sort of shoot the light through at different angles. And, and he, he comes to this conclusion when he's in, in Greece and he's, um, he's been going to, I think it's at an Orthodox church and there was tesserae on the wall mm. and, and he'd always looked at it under incandescent light. And at some point there was a, a holy day and they were lighting, it was dark and they were, they brought down a chandelier and they were lighting it candle by candle. And he said they got up to the uh, fourth tier of the chandelier and he looked and the, this wall came alive in a way that he'd never seen before because he realized the tesserae were meant to be seen by candlelight and that they were at different angles. They, they were, and they were literally projecting the light through, like that's how the painting existed. It was a site of projection. So I, I mean, that he dedicates this, you know, one of the, most masterful examples of that use of projection to Isaac Rabin is, is incredible. And um, it made me think of, uh, you know, Audre Lorde and, uh, but also of, of uh, you know, when she talks about uh, Golda Meir and, you know, 
and 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 also, I guess also Margaret Atwood uh, when she says that just that the beating of your heart doesn't stop someone else's. You know, it's very beautiful. The, um, yes, uh, I mean, I, I those are great. Those are great thoughts and. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, light was at least the equal, if not the better of color for Jack, despite how wonderful he is with color and how inventive he is with color. Um, in, especially in his later years, he talked more and more and more about light and how important uh, the reflectivity was and that the light that was in the acrylic, which was also in his head. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, he would, he would keep referring mm -hmm. back to mm -hmm. the fact that it that it was all mental and you can see an aperture and in, in a letting in light in 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 the, in the mm. you know you also feel like this flicker and yeah. when you're standing in front of the work especially if you can see the exhibition you know we, when they're all together we have we have one more image and oh yeah let's go let's we're, go. we're <laughs> almost out of time i don't know okay if we, okay no and, yeah whether we're going to have a Q and A or not, but okay. the, uh, well, this is our, this is, this was fun. I'm, of, I'm having fun. Of both of us. Yeah. 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 This is, we could go on and on. Yeah. Um, the windows of the mind. I mean, this is, uh, uh, this is such a great work and mm -hmm. so mysterious. Um, and again, it's this a very irregular format and, um, you have the sense that it's it's being invented as he goes along, and uh, I, you know, I certainly don't have a good interpretation of this. It's he says well, it's a monument. You said that you thought. I I I think you talk about it architecturally. Yeah, it, I mean, it, and I you felt know, that as well. You know, I felt like I was in an interior. I mean, at first I thought, oh, he's. He's made some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of camera, or he's, and you know. But then I, I, I was looking at it, and when I also have the feeling of some kind of, um, you know, again, maybe it's because it's in in link with the other works. I had the feeling that um, there were. It wasn't just about one thing. I mean, you know, you have a feeling you can see Malevich in here. Yeah. You, I even had the feeling, you know, but in terms of like a kind of blackness and a kind of black light. And I also thought of churches, interior churches where, you know, you get like, for example, in the Dutch um, painter uh, Sarandam, you know, so from, you know, 1597 to 1665. So you could, you would see this painter in the Reichs and he always does these church interiors and they're right at that moment of uh, after of Dutch reform. So, you know, after the uh, iconoclast uh, riots, you know, so that everything's been cut, taken away from the churches, all, all the remnants, but, mm -hmm. you know, you still can see that. So you, they're very subtle because, and they're also made from, um, more from a kind of geom geometric proposition or a kind of uh, perspective, a kind of gate. They're not really observed except as a kind of uh, science or math problem. They're not necessarily literal interiors. So that feeling of something having been removed or destroyed and that instead of this kind of white light moving through it that you would expect in a kind of church interior. It's like all these different layers of kind of black light moving through. That, that's how I started to read it as, as some sort of, as sort of the aftermath of something that had happened. Yeah, as if, as if the darker um, areas become atmospheric uh, mm -hmm. perhaps in, in with the, uh, with the uh, lighter areas being a kind of structure this is uh, this detail is the uh, the left hand side of the whole thing, and just to the there are uh, three areas in in that very large surface there that are squared off a bit, and if we go back to the back? whole yeah. thing, mm -hmm. so back to number twenty three. Yeah, so that I mean, on the uh, 
on the left hand side, the one that's easiest to see, I guess, is is the upper part of that vertical area there where there's a squarish or rectangular part that's lighter and it's mm -hmm. also denser. And mm -hmm. you, you know, my fantasy is that somehow that is the power of painting that that he's referring to. That that that's it's as if there's a painting there within mm. this mm. spatial structure. Uh, and the and that area of density is doing something that's a little bit different from what everything else is different uh, is doing. And and then everything of is of course a painting anyway. That's what that's what he's given us. But but when, I, I thought it was like they, they'd been removed and but they're mm, still in space. I, yeah. Somehow this damage had yeah. happened. But like you know how when you see when a painting gets off the wall, you still see that it was oh, there. Yes, when the, you, yeah, the ghost they, image. That, the ghost image and that it's still there, like even in the violence or the destruction. Mm. I mean, given sure. that 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 the, the whole series is about that. In some ways, that, I mean, and and that would, yeah, that would be the power of painting, and 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 uh, not, you know, now I see more clearly your Sandra Dam uh, analogy, and but I don't think it's, I, I mean, I think that's just you could think that, but I, I don't, mm. I, but I feel like he, especially, I'm, I'm, I don't feel like I said it well with the Ron Brown, the way that he captures things, and they are, can be more than one thing, and it's not at all wishy washy. It's it's really about this this way in which it, they can encompass, he could actually really specifically put several different ideas, you know, paintings into this one image, you know, that like there's, the, it could turn and become something else suddenly in that way yep. it, that, that they feel very sculptural in that way where suddenly it turns and it's something else. And then, yeah. And and the, the flip side of that thought, I think is, um, it is the fact that we cannot explain his work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other, in other words, uh, you know, to to explain Jack's work, and I don't think he explained it either, or wanted to explain it, no. because no. for him as well, it just kept generating mm -hmm. more things to see, more more ideas. We we will have Q and A, Ellen. Shall we do that? Apparently, Can we yeah, move let's, on. Okay, let's, let's do that. Try it. So there's, uh, all right. There's oh, a so question. There's, you you should describe it, this. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll just I'll just read it from the chat. Uh, oh yeah. Can can you put it back on again? It went away. What is the tesserae and what material? Yeah, okay. Is it? Uh, do you want to answer that, Ellen, or should I? No, or? you you. Do you I well, mean I well I think that it's an it's an acrylic medium. And he apparently was working with acrylics really early. He was working with, um, in New York, the people who, uh, family Lee Boncour, I believe. Uh, yeah. and, and so he was, he had really early access. I think he traded work for um, expensive new scientific developments and acrylic paints when he was doing the slab paintings. And, um, and then he started to create these, uh, you saw uh, in the, the work from the 80s, these molds. And then he, he very quickly, when he moved to Tesserae, he's making these kind of, he's cutting into the acrylic. And, and so he can have inside of the acrylic and it could be, I mean, it could be anything. It could be a kind of matte medium, but you know, there's so much science there that he could have added, um, uh, you know, he could have added different kinds of things to get it shiny or not shiny or, or transparent, you know, so it's basically plastic um, acrylic and, and then inside of that, there will be some amount of pigment and, and he talks about it to some points that there's only there's 90% acrylic and maybe 10% pigment, so he can really vary how much pigment he's using so that mineral is floating that pigment mineral is floating in this kind of translucent. Um, acrylic uh, medium that then becomes hardened, almost like a resin. There, there's a, a, another question uh, came up, which is, uh, which, uh, you know, how would we uh, uh, articulate the way in which Jack was distinguished from his peers? Uh, and the, the group of friends um, 
a number of uh, fellow African American painters that he associated with, in the, in, especially in the late '60s, they were they were an, important for him. But I I think he does stand out in uh, to varying degrees, I suppose, depending on to whom we compare him. But he stands out because of this balance between you know, what we might call the scientific and the spiritual, which is very much a part of him. And, or, you know, it's, if we go back to Carver, it's the combination of the empirical worker, the scientist, and the speculative artist, with uh, Carver being interested in painting, with, in imagery. And in, in Jack, the philosophical side of the scientific enterprise, the curiosity about physics and mathematics and topology, which was important for him. I think that comes but, from the Jessup wagon as well. I mean, I think it's really his, his confidence to when he talks about being in the woodshed in the 80s. You know, mm. I, I don't think his peer group, I think he knows his peer group is the world. And I think he, he has this. So I don't think I'm not, I don't measure him against a, a group of, of black artists only, you know, I mean, I think that's yeah. what happened to him over and over again, is that they were presented as, um, you know, uh, black painters, or, you know, that when they got a show at the MoMA, they would get this kind of old fashioned. Uh, and, and that for me, what makes him incredible is that he survived that. That, and he survived that because he had this idea of this topography and this, and, and I think that has to do with George Washington Carver the, and the Tuskegee Institute and the colleagues he makes in New York and around the world. I mean, you know, there's this image of, of uh, Norman Lewis uh, spending the summer in his house painting that he provided that kind of space for people. Yeah, and he, I mean, he definitely thought of himself as, as um, going into territory that no one else was going into and no one else had gone into. And mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, he was deeply offended by, by being compared only to African-American artists. And he was, saw himself as competing with every artist in the world. And, and yet that commune of, of, of uh, mostly man of brothers that he made, I think, mm. sustained him. And, and I think, um, I mean, that's what I think of when I, I think of uh, uh, Jack Whitten, I think of his autonomy and that he was able to um, survive outside of certain kinds of recognition and, and not, and, and actually develop majestically regardless and, and not like have that be isolating. I, I think that's what I think about that he was always generating, you know. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's it, if we if we go back to around 1970, what's again what's remarkable is how he, in a way, he was already there. He was making, he had made mental photographs, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, and everything that follows is a development beyond, 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 beyond. And he just, he just kept going. I don't know if there's uh, another Q and A, I mean, another question now, okay. or whether we are Saying goodbye. supposed to, supposed to <laughs> sign off. I'm not okay. sure. Yeah. We're oh. <laughs> novices okay. at we this. We can say Ellen. goodbye. I think All we right. say goodbye. We, we okay. will say goodbye. All right. Really good to see you, Richard. Yeah, great, great having you, Ellen. And, yeah, okay. Well, wonderful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's and been, let's not wait another seven years. Yeah, like it's been too too long since we okay. had to had a chance to talk, and we're okay. talking about somebody great to talk about. Okay, Jack. Bye. It was really fun. Okay. Bye.